Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Rolf Jacobson. And me, Matt Skinner. So the readings for July 25, 2021, which is the ninth Sunday after Pentecost. First reading, 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 42 through 44, the alternate semi-continuous Old Testament reading is 2 Samuel 11, 1 through 15. Psalm 145, 10 through 18, we have our third reading from Ephesians chapter 3, 14 through 21. And today, this Sunday, we begin our five-week session, sessions, Sundays in John 6. And I know that every single preacher out there has been looking forward to this. Uh, always in year B, year of Mark, having these five Sundays in the Bread of Life discourse. And here it is. Begins today. I think are people happy? are excited about this part of it. It's when we get to like, you know, August 8th or 15th or so, it might be a little shot in the arm. That's true. Well, that's why we're here, right? Sermon Brainwave co-hosts. Yeah. What do we shot in the arm? What do we do with this? I think I maybe mistakenly said recently that we get six weeks. It's only five. I'm only suddenly five. I'm, I'm suddenly cheered. <laughs> <laughs> only five weeks. We can do this. All right, so uh, a couple of things as we set this out, uh, as, we, as we begin this. The first is uh, to recognize that John 6, 1 through 21 uh, is, is the narration of the signs on which this, the rest of the chapter is based. And so, uh, this is a typical pattern in John of the sign and then a dialogue discourse that follows. And what we what we get, you know, just to kind of map that out there going forward, that uh, that the meat of the discourse, that is Jesus' interpretation of the sign, uh, is th verses thirty five through fifty nine. Wait, so did you just mix your metaphors? What? How? When you said the meat of the discourse, this is about bread. Oh, well, that's true. Yeah, yeah. So I'm so sorry. Yeah. I don't really have anything to say about this the rest of the time except for jokes. So keep going. <laughs> so 35 through 59 is the is the discourse itself. So Jesus interpreting the sign. Uh, what does this sign mean? And and at the end of the day, the point of all the signs is: Do you see that this sign points to? The presence of God. So that's that's what really the discourse is going to do is to say, yes, uh, yes, I just you know fed five thousand people. Yes, I, I I can feed you. But what what difference does that make? And the and the difference always is the presence of God in your midst uh, in Jesus. And that's so the signs are pointing to that truth. Uh, and then we, and but that discourse is framed by two dialogues, verses 25 through sections of dialogue, verses 25 through 34 is the first section of dialogue, and then 60 to 71. So looking ahead uh, toward uh, the last verses of the, of the Bread of Life uh, passage uh, chapter. So, and the dialogues are important because they're meant to overhear the way in which people are responding to this. They're, they're making sense. They're trying to make sense of what does this sign mean? What is, what is it telling us? What are we to look for? What are we to hear? What are we to see? And so uh, that's, the, that's the nature. We'll talk about that more next week when we get into those verses. So that sets it up. And then there are a few details about this particular telling of the feeding of the 5,000 and the walking on water that we can point to. Can I uh, ask, a, oh, I guess it's a question. It's maybe it's a comment disguised as a question. So in the commentary, Robert Hope said something that really caught my attention about how we've been trained to read the story through the lens of the synoptics, largely as a story about compassion and Jesus feeding the hungry. 
all really good things. But maybe we need to really we need to relearn or, or learn differently how to read it in John, where it's not so much a story of compassion and, and soothing hunger, although of course it is that, but the main emphasis is this idea of Jesus giving himself. Mm -hmm. um, first, I'm curious what you think of that, Caroline, but the maybe that's the, that's the question part. The statement part is, that sounds really right to me and an important way mm -hmm. of reading it in John, not to suggest that feeding the hungry is somehow just a, um, sign of a deeper spirituality or something like that you know not to diminish the work of the church to feed the hungry mm -hmm. but to think about this is first and foremost a story about not jesus as one who provides food and sustenance but just jesus who provides himself who offers himself in this kind of full-bodied way it almost makes sacramental ways of talking too small or almost obsolete right because mm -hmm. there's this idea of of a Jesus who's as close to us as the food we put into our mouths. Oh yeah, I, nearby yeah. or you guys want to throw me out of the church now? What do you? What do you? Where are no, we? I, I absolutely agree with that. You know, the the feeding of the five thousand, of course, is the only miracle of Jesus that appears in all four of the Gospels. So historically, that comparison is then justified because you're looking at okay, how does this story get told, and how is it? How does it function in each one of the gospels uh, and and how it's set out in the synoptics is that response of of compassion and but and there is some of that here where Jesus looked up this is in verse five when he looked up and saw a large crowd coming toward him Jesus said to Philip where are we to buy bread for these people to eat that's the key because Yes, Jesus anticipates the needs of the crowd. They need to be fed. Uh, but, but immediately, it's, it's not something to, I mean, it says to test him. He knew what he was going to do. But it's not to test him in like a, you know, um, manipulative kind of way. But it's to, it's to lead to, this is going to be way more, that, yes, I'm going to feed them, but this is going to be way more than that. This is an offering. And, and I think the other offering, as you said, of, of his actual self and, and that relationship uh, that is so important in John. And I think the other detail that, that, uh, that supports that claim is the fact that this is located at uh, it, where uh, the, now the Passover, the festival of the Jews was near that this whole, this is the second occurrence or reference to the Passover. The first one was back in chapter two. And then of course we'll have uh, chapter 13. So that, that, that larger theological framework or reference of what did God do at Passover? What does Passover celebrate uh, is, is, has to be taken into an account for this particular, um, for this, the Jesus narration of this event if that makes sense. So I think, yeah, I think that's absolutely right. What's the Passover connection then? I mean, it's not in connection to the meal, but it's this idea of provision. Yeah, uh, well, I think liberation. provision, but also, I'm sorry, what? Or liberation, I guess is my other word. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think those are some of the theological themes that are that are present. And it's a, it's a provision that has to do with, um, and liberation that has to do with relationship. Uh, and uh, that is uh, that is you know centralized particularly in the Gospel of John and Jesus. What gets you know what gets uh, what gets a lot of the time here is uh, is connections to how this is a reworking of the manna, giving of the manna in the wilderness. But this is all this is all connected to um, this is all connected to Exodus and the libera and liberation and maintaining of relationship. So those are, I think, some of the larger themes that you don't want to you don't want to pass over here, and that are, are that are distinctive for John with regard to what we were talking about earlier, comparison in comparison to the synoptics. And what you know, one other thing I would I would say about that is the uh, the the you know the walking on the water. Uh, is is also I think ind indicative of this is 
this is an offering of Jesus, of Jesus presence, because this is the second, you know, it is said is, it is I, but it's really should be I am, do not be afraid. And it's the second absolute I am after 426 in the gospel. And so we know we, so then again, we know that this is going to be, um, this is a revelation of Jesus identity, who really is Jesus. Uh, and not, not only what Jesus can do, but that Jesus is the very I am himself, 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 God's self, you know, you know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, I bring that up because I, I wonder if some of the ways we preach this is just, well, we're going to do the story this week. And then the next following four weeks, we'll start to mystify the story, right? Or we'll symbolize the story. We'll Christologize the story. And maybe we do our congregations a better service if we already start to make those connections now in what looks mm -hmm. like, for lack of a better word, an ordinary feeding miracle. Yeah, right. <laughs> ordinary in the sense that we've seen this before. Um, because these are these great Sunday school stories. This is, you know, it's it's much easier to do a children's sermon on this part of John six than it is the following four weeks. Yeah, um, but, but I think to make those connections here is really important. I mean, one of the other distinctions of of John's version, it's Jesus Himself feeds the five thousand, sure. uh, where in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it's the disciples, uh, yeah. and that's that's a significant difference. And of course, there's abundance. Uh, in each of the tellings, you know, the 12 baskets here, uh, what is it, seven in Mark. Uh, and uh, so there's, there's so much that there's 12 baskets left over. Now that's, that abundance is in all four, uh, but here it connects back to the abundance that we get. We, we heard about in John two of the abundance of wine. So here you have wine and bread. And then also looking forward that there is no right Lord, there is no last supper. Well, there's a last supper, but there's no Lord's supper. There's no Eucharist, um, which I want to talk about a lot more next week, but uh, <laughs> this is it. This is, this is, this is the giving of Jesus uh, of his body um, and as, as flesh to eat is a giving that happens in his life and not connected to his death. And that is another way that this, this whole miracle is underscoring a Jesus of giving, of giving himself, giving of himself and giving his life to them, um, the entirety of his life. And so the Eucharist and, or Lord's Supper, whatever in John is not commemoration, it's not remembrance, and it's not tied to a particular event in Jesus' life, his death, but really a giving of his entire life uh, not giving his, not just giving his life over. Yeah. All right. Well, the, it's the, I think more to come. It's going to be great. Well, this, I think one bit of advice we're giving is people should read ahead. Yeah. If you're gonna dig into this and, and develop a bit of a plan and you'll see the Robert Hope commentaries for three more, two more weeks, three more weeks. Yep. I've forgotten, mm -hmm. but, um, so there's that. I think the fish get overlooked. I'm just going to say this, that it's all about the bread. If, it could yeah. be Jesus. This could be the tilapia discourse in John yeah, six. If the he fish could, in direction. The fish come back in John twenty one. But they he never says. Fish. He never says, "I am the fish." No, no. But he he makes that was, sure that they catch a lot of fish in no John twenty one. Do you see a connection between this and? Never mind. I'm kidding. So we. Sh <laughs> I, I want to say. I, I want to say two. Just two brief things. One is, it's also a, just. just it's all the connections to the Exodus story are worth teasing out as a way of kind of setting this up. But um, it's a story not only of provision, but of abundance. Yeah. You know, the, the detail of the leftovers in all four gospels, this is important. Is We live in a world where we have so much, but people are afraid they're gonna lose it and they're not gonna have enough. Especially, you know, maybe people who grew up with not very much. Um, mm -hmm. But 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 the promise of God's abundance is is really important. And the other thing is I, the detail. This is different, right? So when Jesus realized they were about to come and take him by force, and then you're thinking, like Luke four, to throw him over the cliff. No, it's to make him king. Mm -hmm. He withdrew. I mean, that's just a great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
And I, I think, you know, that abundance, uh, that abundance theme, Rolf, that you brought up is, of course, one of the significant connections to the, the thematic reading, the second king's reading, because you have that, uh, they shall eat and have some left. He said it before then they ate and had some left, according to the word of the Lord. So you've got that connection. I almost wonder, though, if, if you're, if you I mean, there's nothing wrong with the second Kings, but I, am, I almost wonder if you want to swap out and just stay in Exodus for the next <laughs> um, Exodus and even numbers. Yeah, you the, can, I mean, you know, for the next just, five weeks. But. We really don't need to comment very much on second Kings four. It's such a, it's such a thumbnail story uh, that with the, not much to it. Um, the only thing I want to say is um, just a reminder that of all the figures in the Old Testament, Jesus looks the most like Elijah and Elisha. Yeah. So. Yeah. Okay. But now we'll get to a story uh, that is. Um, yeah. Well, but should yeah. we say something about the psalm first? I was going to say, let's talk about the psalm first. Yeah, and then yeah, because there you give them food in due season. Uh, you open your hands, satisfying the desire of every living thing. So the, you know, there, there's, there are ways I think that you can bring this psalm into. I say this all the time, but it gives you language, gives you vocabulary uh, for uh, some of those theological claims that we're making about uh, about about John six. Because at the end of the day, it is at the, it's not just a revelation of who Jesus is, but it's a revelation of who God is and what God, what God is doing in Jesus. And so I think that's what I would do with, that's what I would do with the Psalm. The um, verses 15 and 16 that you, that you uh, started to quote, I think it was in the catechism that Luther suggested this is a table prayer. This is a great ecumenical table prayer uh, or, or interfaith even uh, with um, Jewish cousins, uh, the eyes of all, or the eyes of all creation look to you. Uh, you give them their food in due season. You open your hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. There's a, there's a parallel phrase in Psalm 104 that's almost identical, uh, but there it is again, it's uh, the provision and abundance of God. Um, I also, um, this psalm bears witness to the ongoing agency of God in and through the world, that God is at work outside, I mean, uh, of our hands. There, there, uh, there's an old liberal present phrase is, we are the only hands God has. Not true. Uh, God is at work uh, throughout creation. Um, this, and so that... Um, Verse 14, the Lord upholds all who are falling, raises those who are bowed down. If you go elsewhere, what's God doing? Setting the prisoners free, you know, uh, healing the sick, uh, you know, lifting up the lowly, casting the mighty down, that God is at work um, outside of our, outside of our ministry. We don't possess God. God is bigger than us. God's mission is bigger than the church. Um, God's mission has a church and we are part. And so our call is to participate, find what God is doing, bring our unique role as the Christian church to God's mission. Uh, but we are not the entirety of God's plan or God's work. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, 2 Samuel 11, 1 to 15 uh, is a... Um, uh, I'm having a really hard time with it this year. Um, I don't, I mean, I always have a hard time with it, but, uh, uh, and because, it, because of what it is. And I, I, I guess this year in particular, just particularly, I don't know why, but particularly struck by um, uh, Bathsheba's the only words that she is says is I am pregnant. Um, and which in that, you know, in that phrase just encapsulates so much 
Um, it, it's, it's, it, it's, you know, well, how many words is it in Hebrew, Rolf? Probably one. One? Probably. I mean, I could yeah. look it up really fast. I mean, um, just in that, you know, in that one word, uh, the fact or that one claim, that one statement of, of her situation, of what's happened uh, is her, uh, is objectification, powerlessness, rape, defenselessness. Uh, it's two, yeah, it's two words and it, um, yeah. but the, yeah, go ahead though. But that, that's what, I mean, that, that's what I would focus on uh, in preaching this is to say in the, in that those are the words that she's given. What do those words mean? Um, or the, those two words, and that's the phrase that she's given. What does, what is she saying in that? Uh, and letting, letting her speak uh, um, and letting her speak the truth of what's happened to her uh, and, uh, and and naming and naming that truth, particularly since those are the only words she gets. It's a story about two men. It's not really a story about her at all, is it? I mean, it's it's largely a story of David and and um, and Uriah. Well, and that's why I guess I want to give her the. <laughs> well, that's why it's a problem. I mean, it's part of why it's a problem, I, I suppose, the way it's narrated, mm -hmm. as well as what's narrated. You know the. Yeah. Yeah, because she's she's the she's the object. She's she's what get what you know what is used and um, and and the ways in which that is uh, uh, that that she's powerless. That she she doesn't have any you know she doesn't not given the option to say no. Um, <laughs> uh, and so I think that's why I'm I'm so centered on the on that claim of giving her voice in a, in a story where she has none. It, uh, this is a case where the reader constructs meaning in some degree from the text. No matter what way you come at this, this is a story of sin, of David for sure, um, of the king. And it's a story of sexual exploitation. Whether that is a story of rape, which is the, a, a newer reading, or the more traditional reading, a story of adultery. One of the reasons I um, want to defend the reading of it as a story of adultery and not dismiss those who want to read it as rape is because it's really the only story of adultery and the massive destructiveness that comes out of adultery that in our culture, adultery is, is really portrayed so often on t on t in in media as a victimless crime. Um, it's not a crime, sorry, but as a victimless sin. But here the, the, in this story, if you think about it that way, look at all the victims that happen. And, of, and it's not just Uriah that's murdered. It's, he is the, you know, he is the captain of a group of, um, you know, he, so when they pull back, they don't give him the order. Everybody fall back except for that group, you know, who are slaughtered. All so David can cover up his um, so his sin or crime and or crime, and then a, a larger uh, crime of the murder of. And of course. So I'll stop there because I saw you wanted to get in, Caroline. Well, I, I think where I, I disagree or I want to push back on that reading is that for me, adultery implies uh, mutuality. Uh, it implies um, a, a sense of, of agency on the part of both parties. Uh, and but I don't can read hear, it that way. I don't. I don't hear any agency yeah, for Bathsheba. None. I do. Uh, sure. But what is it? I mean, it, it, she. So, so she. Um, David sends she, messengers to get her. Let me try. Let me just try. Yeah. Uh, and because this way it's been read for the longer part of the history, which is um, the fact that she trusts him enough to send the word that she's pregnant, uh, which is. If she is a, 
if you read her as a rape victim, then you have to, ex and that's fine to read it that way. Then you have to explain what's, why does she send to a, a rapist to say I'm pregnant? Because a rapist doesn't care. Uh, and, and, but if it's, I'm just saying you have to, yeah. you can no. read it to say is, is at the power differential to me is the, is the major issue. David is the king and yeah, he sends and he takes whatever he wants because that's what kings do. And um, he then tries to cover it up, right? And this, this, this elaborate thing where, you know, he, uh, he, Uriah the Hittite, maybe a foreigner, it, you know, if, if you take that part serious, a foreigner in the service is more holy than David. You know, he says, I, listen, my troops are in the, uh, in the field, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna be disloyal to them. You know, he, David tries to get him drunk so that he'll, you know, he's trying to get him to have sex with his wife so that the, that the fact that she's pregnant with David's uh, child will not be discoverable, but he won't do it because he is more, you know, sort of. And then in older readings of her, I actually can't stand this uh, this reading. They're like, "Oh, there must have been a problem in the marriage. Uh, the fact that he uh, that he won't have sex with her." No, no. Oh, that's just ridiculous. No, but it's out there. <laughs> it's yeah. There's lots of stuff out there yeah. about this story. Yeah, I just I don't think that I can. Um, you know, with the the fact that she goes that she sent and told David, "I am pregnant." I hear that as um uh well yeah maybe he, he, he of course he doesn't care but it's her way of saying um you know this is what you did to me um and uh this is this is the this is the result of your action uh and this is the situation that you've put me in uh and um uh, I, yeah, I, that's, that's where, that's what I hear. And um, so, you know, it's, uh, we have different ways of, of, of entering into it. Uh, but I, 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 for me, I hear this passage as uh, the way, and, and particularly in the way of how, um, the historically, the way in which women are, are, are the object of sexual violence and, um, or, or have no, absolutely no choice or agency in that regard. So that's, that's, yeah, that's where I am. Okay. Ephesians. <laughs> Matt, you want to weigh in on this at all? But I appreciate the, the dialogue, Rolf. Well, we, I, I'll, I'll weigh in briefly just to say I appreciate the dialogue too. I, I, I think three years ago I talked about this as well. I mean, it, it, it seems to me that this is uh, a, a massive <laughs> uh, abuse of power on David's part and that Bathsheba is totally denied agency. I, I do think rape is probably the right term to use, but I do, I was struck this year, like I said, in reading this and seeing even the narrator has constructed a story that's pretty much about two men contending over Bathsheba's sexuality. You know, even so, even Uriah with his, his righteousness, the assumption is, right, if he's home and he gets to go inside the house, he gets to sleep with his wife, right? There's even no talk of like that looks like within the marriage. And, you know, it's not a story about that. I get that. But it's, it's these two, it's these yeah. two uh, men and it's this virtue contest and, and Bathsheba's own role or agency is just utterly um, eclipsed by the story like that, which I think is um, a, obviously a problem with a lot of biblical narrative. This is not the only story where we encounter that. Right. But it needs to be, I think Bathsheba's voice or lack thereof needs to be recovered in some ways to preach on this, or at least to pull people into some wondering about why does the story, um, yeah. why is it too easy for some people to interpret this story? Why is it a story that, that grates on our sensibilities in all sorts of different ways and open up some space to really, um, as a preacher, to really talk about that. If, if your sermon is 
is really morally uncomplicated because you've assigned roles to all of these three main characters and you need to probably go back and rework it but yeah you go ahead you take the last word and we can we well, can then i want to jump and say two other things then carolyn last word <laughs> first of all verse one notice there's a text critical problem that i won't go into but um if this is the correct reading in the spring of the year the time when kings go out to battle David is not where he's supposed to be. Yeah. David's yeah. vocation is to be out at battle and David's not. David is not where he's supposed to be. He's not doing his royal vocation. He's remained uh, at home. Yeah. Fault uh, number 1. Second That's thing, a, a way of if 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 yeah, right. If a way of recovering some of Bathsheba's agency is to recognize her role in the first couple chapters of First Kings. Yeah. That this is not the only place Bathsheba occurs. That she, she plays the major role. Um, this child dies. Uh, she, uh, as a wife of the king, um, then gives birth to more, including Solomon. And she then plays the major role when David dies. David has older sons who are in line for the throne. And, and she plays the major role in securing the throne for her son, Solomon. So in those places, uh, there's more to her than this story. I appreciate you saying that because I, I think that is an important last word. That's another way that, because at the end of the day, it is a story about David. Let's not be let, let's not pretend about this. It's a story about David. The, the Bible is a patriarchal collection of books and we are interested in David. We're not interested in Bathsheba. So then, then um, reading for any kind of agency or voice with regard to the character of women, characters of women, you have to engage in uh, some different kinds of hermeneutics. And, uh, and, and so how, so what is it that you can bring to give voice to Bathsheba and what you've named Rolf is a critical aspect of that, of carrying this story forward and her role then in the, then the larger genealogy of, 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 and then evident, and then eventually um, Jesus. So I appreciate that. We have to say uh, some people are preaching all through Ephesians uh, this summer. So uh, we've gone on uh, quite a bit, but we should at least but important, talk but important, important. Yep. about Ephesians. Well, I, it's, it's a prayer, which is, it's always interesting when, when the Bible has people praying because it raises questions about why do we pray? Do we pray to be heard by God? Do we pray so that we can articulate something ourselves? Do we pray corporately so that we can send messages to the congregation? Uh, does the prayer, does the post-sermon prayer, the prayers of the people, whatever you call it, uh, recite the sermon again, just in case people weren't listening? Or argue with it if, if you disagree with the pastor? Yeah, so it's, you know, it's, it, it raises questions like that. There was something in the commentary by Israel uh, Kamuzadu, if I pronounced that right, or if I'm wrong, I, I apologize, but when he talks about... Um, we're, we talk about inviting people into the church, but what does it mean to expose people to a life of prayer? Which I just found really interesting uh, in a culture where I think a lot more people in our society, in American society, pray, admit that they pray, even more people than who admit that they believe in God, which is fascinating. Uh, people who don't describe themselves as very religious nevertheless pray. And so Prayer is one of the things that the church tends to reserve for insiders. We do it when the congregation is gathered uh, and the doors are, are closed or a service is taking place. But what does it mean to consider the church a community of prayer um, and prayer on behalf of others? And how can the church offer guidance to other people who are working their own things out through prayer and other means of trying to encounter God? So instead of prayer being this thing that we do once people are in the door, how does the church cultivate prayerfulness in a population or among people? And how is that through our public prayer or our public statements, whether those are spoken or written or symbolic or whatever, but it just has me thinking about 
not so much the content of this passage, but just the effect of a letter writer offering a prayer for others to overhear and to provide guidance in not just what to pray or pray about, but why we pray in the first place.